All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Justin Louie. I am a mentor for 599, and uh, I am going to be teaching you guys about how to develop a successful scouting system today. So what we'll be going over is first a little bit about my background, and then selecting a platform, determining how you're going to use it for your team, what data you actually want to collect from it, and how to actually use it in a competition, and then the next steps you can go through from after this presentation. So a little bit about my background. As I mentioned, I am from FRC 1678 Citrus Circuits, where I was a student from the competition years of 2017 to 2020. Uh, I was part of the software scouting sub team, and I was also the strategy sub team lead for uh, 2019 to 2020. I helped with various outreach projects, but one of the main things was definitely my strategy contributions. Now I am a mentor for 599, where I help with the leadership and the strategy, and a little bit of a disclaimer, I am not a physically technical person. I've never touched, coded, or designed a robot. So if you have those questions, highly recommend you guys go to someone else. All right, so we're going to start off with selecting a scouting platform. There are three main types of scouting systems that have been seen out there so far. There's paper, Google form, and a custom electronic one. So paper scouting forms are the most simple to design and, in my opinion, the least efficient to use. Uh, they're easy to develop because you can design it within a single hour and then just use it at every competition. All you need to do is use a Google Doc to make it and then uh, print it out for your uh, team and you can use it all the time. Uh, you don't have to worry about internet connection. You don't have to worry about having uh, any capital to develop it or dedication of resources for it. It is also easy to use because all you have to do is give people a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. However, it is a little bit inefficient in a way in that you have to actually transfer the data actively. You have to have someone write it down and compile it into being averages, or you have to have them develop a way of communicating it to the leads so that they don't spend their whole time analyzing the data instead of creating match strategies. It's also not going to be an efficient use of your time if you end up going into a pick list meeting where all you have are sheets of data, but not accumulated by each team into a single sheet. The other thing is at competitions, it's really heavy to transport. I've seen a lot of teams carry around uh, giant crates full of paper, pens, and um, just hard, hard surfaces to write on so that they can actually use it at the competition. And it is definitely a workout to carry it if you are walking to and from the venue. The next would be Google Scouting Forms and combining it with something like Excel Sheets or Tableau. This one is also really easy to develop. It requires no capital. You can develop it within a day. And there isn't as much uh, technical knowledge needed. You just need to know the strategy and what you want to collect. It's easy for scouts to use. Uh, because they are used to using Google Forms, but uh, and it has built-in visualization uh, by averages and so forth, but it might be inefficient for scouts to enter the data. So for example, uh, you will find in some of the examples I have on the upcoming slides, it's not the easiest to enter in the data. So for example, if you look at the high hub auto, I have a your answer. It's a short answer uh, that you can fill in. And that means you actually have to type it in. But that means that every time a robot scores into the high hub in the 2022 game, you have to update that. Instead of using a counter or a uh, button that says a certain amount of scores in, you have to retype it in, which means deleting it and entering it in, which means a lot more time off of the field and on your phone or whatever you're filling the answers in on. Uh, the other issue is it requires scouts to have actually charged cell phones and sells and a good cell signal. Some uh, competition venues don't have the greatest of cell signals, so that often is a problem uh, that people have encountered. If you don't remember to have your phones pack uh, or have your scouts pack battery packs, you're also going to run into an issue where by probably lunchtime their phones might be dying. Along with that, Google Forms is great because it's simple to use, but it doesn't have as much of the 
available customization of data entry, as I was mentioning. So you are limited to, for example, 10 possible answers for a, uh, how many did they score if you do a, from one to 10 as your data entry? Uh, you would have to either go like one to two, three to four, five to six, and so on to get to the 20 scored into the high hub this year, or you would have to go with the, your answer. As I already mentioned, if you go with a, any type of electronic scouting form, you need to bring additional power sources for your scouts or remind them to do it, but prepare for them to forget packing that. Personally, my favorite would be a custom scouting app. This is what I spent my whole time on Citrus Circuits developing, where we were able to uh, design it from scratch, which means we decided what data points we wanted, how we wanted it entered, and we could have many more uh, pieces of data collected without the scouts even having to enter it in. So this includes using toggles to say that they just did or did not do something with a single press of a button. Uh, we had counters so that we just incremented by them pressing a single button up and down how many they scored. Or we also had timers so that as soon as they press a single button, it starts a timer. And when they press it again, it stops the timer. We have it so that there's a time scale throughout a match so that or a timeline throughout the match. So we have it marked from T equals zero to T equals 215 seconds. This makes it really good for calculating how long it takes them to do something, or even finding out what is the crucial point in a match where scoring something doesn't matter anymore and where we can look at other data. You can also include customizable algorithms to figure things out if you program a server with algorithms and so forth. So some of the things that we did was rankability, which I will explain in future slides, driver scores and defense scores, which is a subjective way of calculating out how good of a driver they are in comparison to others and how good they are at defense in comparison to others. You're able to actually choose how you visualize your apps a little bit more. So instead of pulling up a spreadsheet on your phone, which is not the best to do at a competition, you could have a data viewing app or in a pick list app that are specialized to presenting the data that you want when you want it. The cons of this are it is potentially expensive and that you need to be able to buy the tablets or whatever devices you plan to use it on if you choose to not have it on an iPhone or just an Android phone. You also need to be able to purchase the computers if you possibly to uh, program. If your teammates do not all have computers, you also need to be able to provide charging outlets and so forth. And you might need to find an additional way to transfer data. This is also very labor intensive in that it takes a lot of time and people to do it. So I've seen some teams take one to two people and completely spend their whole off season and summers designing a scouting system to be used in the fall and uh, actually implemented into their upcoming uh, competition season, such as team eight. My friend Caleb, he uh, designed it all by himself and did it all in React and then uh, got it up in one year. And then there are other teams that have five to 10 people doing it. And on the larger side I've seen, there could be up to 20 people programming it for about eight-ish apps. So just be aware of that if you choose to go with the custom scouting apps, but you can also limit how much you want to do with it to make it a simple enough system for what your team needs or what they can do. So when you go into this, there are different things to consider. Uh, generally, I would classify as Android versus web because I don't imagine every single team wanting to buy every single student an Apple device to, pro, uh, to have a scouting app on. So the pros of an Android system are you have set types of devices where you know, oh, it's this model with this dimension. Uh, I know that I can cache and have local data. And there's lots of documentation on how to actually program it whether you're using Java or Kotlin in Android studios or looking through different data libraries. The difficult part of this is it's a little bit more expensive. If you are trying to have a consistent type of device that your team has, you are going to want to purchase all of the tablets or all of the phones for everyone to use. You can get them for relatively cheap, probably about 20 to $30 a tablet, which does add up, but it is relatively cheap. Uh, and you will also have to figure out some sort of data transfer system. You cannot have it rely on internet at a competition because they do not allow hotspots and tablets generally don't have uh, data plans. 
So what our team found was we could either do it via a QR or a barcode system, uh, but you can also do it via a wire, like a hard connection system that might get a little bit messy with wires at the competition. Just like the paper scan system, this might be a little bit bulky to travel around with. We had two hard cases, those like Pelican cases filled with tablets and other stuff so that we could bring our stuff to competition. On the other hand, a web app is cheaper. You don't need any hardware to develop it and you can use something like Ionic or React to develop it. It's cheap because all you have to do is upload a app or send a link of an app to a phone and anyone can use it on their phone. You are able to use an actual cell network because these people have cell phones, but you might not be able to rely on their cellular data. So that may be something you want to take into consideration for additional methods of uh, sending the data to whatever uh, processing center you guys have. And because you guys don't have to bring any uh, tablets around, it is a really simple system to pack. All you have to do is have developing computers so that if anything goes wrong, you can debug it on the spot and that is it. To actually use a web app, it also comes with some downsides. So first of all, it requires cellular data, which at competitions, as I've mentioned, is a little bit spotty. And if you guys have a hotspot on, the announcers will call the name of your phone on the speakers, and it is a little bit embarrassing. If you do that, I recommend changing the name of your phone so that it isn't just iPhone and it doesn't have your name in it. Uh, it will have various devices because multiple people will have different types of devices. So it could be as simple as using an iPhone as versus an Android, but there's also different sizes of iPhones and there's different Android sizes as well. Generally, these web app developments uh, environments have a sort of built-in simulator that can simulate the different uh, phone dimensions, but it is something you need to take into consideration when you're uh, designing the constraints of the UI. Finally, there is less documentation for these because they are all relatively newer tools. Flutter, React, and Ionic were the three that were around when I was doing this as a student, and they definitely have more documentation than back then when I was a student, and I have not looked into it. But it's probably not going to be as much as the traditional Android Studios documentation. So that is something to consider. And one more thing, always make sure that there is enough documentation before you do it, which means probably not even a beta uh, software. You want to make sure it is past alpha and beta testing so that it is fully out there. All right, selecting data points. So when you're selecting the data points, you have to consider the goal of the system. Are you using it just to keep the students occupied, which is something that some teams do? I do not recommend that. Are you trying to use it to develop match strategy or find uh, the best teams you want on your alliance? Each of those have different cases and they will tell you what type of data you want. So for example, if you are looking to figure out the alliance strategy, you're probably just gonna to wanna to look at the offensive capabilities of your teammates and maybe the opponents. And that is because all you care about is finding out who the most productive members of the Alliance are to figure out what they are going to do, which chances are they will tell you, they might exaggerate a little bit, but they will tell you what they want to do. And if you need a defense robot, it's probably going to be the other robot or yourself, depending on what role you plan to take in the Alliance. Uh, you can also be trying to figure out who is the best at scoring uh, ranking points in a match and figuring out how to rank above them. These are all different uses of a scouting system that have been used by a number of different teams. One thing to consider is you don't want to add more features or data inputs than necessary. It clutters the viewing systems for the strategists and anyone who needs to see this data. And it actually adds more strain to the scouts during the matches, which will in turn make the data less accurate because they're trying to keep track of too many things. So you want it to be something simple enough where all you have to do is look at it. And you also want it to be uh, having enough information so that it is not a useless system for you guys. So we had three different types of data collection systems uh, on Citrus circuits. Some may say that was overkill, I think it was the perfect amount. So the first type was PIP data. This is purely objective data that does not change between matches. 
You want it to be something that you can gather quickly uh, so that you are able to gather it for every single team within the first day, the first day of setup, not even during uh, the time of qualifications. But as soon as you get in, you need someone to start collecting this data from other teams. You don't want to be interfering with teams in the pits. So generally you want to be able to do it where you can see what type of data you want. So it could be, if you look at their directory, oh, is it going to be a, a tank drive? Is it going to be swerve mechanism or H drive or something else? How many wheels do they have? What type of motors do they have? Or how many do they have? If you want, you can take a photo of them. Uh, honestly, I think that's a very valuable thing because if you're going to review the teams later on, whether for match strategy or for pick lists, with all these numbers, sometimes you get a little bit mixed up and having a photo, a visual reminder is very useful. You can also include other types of data such as climbing capabilities and auto start positions. But generally, those are things that I would recommend that you collect in the actual scouting data of a match. Well, I would consider the standard data points are the auto teleop and end game activities. So every year it breaks down into something very similar. The auto where they did cross an auto line or did some specific, uh, very basic task. Uh, their scoring, did they score in a high, like the easier or the more difficult scoring task of the auto or did they uh, do something else? And finally, did they, where did they start? Some teams actually just drive the robot during auto into an advantageous start position for the upcoming match. That could be something to know. Others could be, oh, they did a five ball auto. Within teleop, there's generally gonna be two to three, maybe even four scoring tasks. It could be shooting in a high goal or, or a low goal. Or if we look back at 2018, there were three scoring tasks, four scoring tasks within the game. They're scoring in this, your switch, the opponent switch, the scale and then into the uh, power-ups area. You can also choose to have uh, intaking of items and defense or counter defense metrics as well. Finally, within end game, there's the end game activity. You can say what activity they did and what level of it. So for example, it could be the low, medium, high or traversal climb this year, or did they climb between them? Did they traverse? So these are all different things that you can choose to enter into your data system. And generally, if you build your system right, you can actually make it very simple to update for each year rather than making it so that you have to rebuild a lot of your app every year. There's defense and driver ability, uh, which are what I would consider subjective data. How can you really say a team has the best driving in a quantitative way? when you're just watching a match. You can't say how fast they're actually going. You can't say, oh, they were able to evade this well. You can, however, compare it to other teams and have someone trained in subjective scouting. This would be the third type of scouting overall. So the way that Citrus did it was we had a rank speed and a rank agility. And we also uh, considered how well they are able to drive on the other side of the field where they might be not as familiar or do not have as great of visibility. So what we did was we had it so that you would say, uh, there are three robots on your alliance and you would rank which one had the best speed and which one had the best agility. So it was ranked one, two, or three, three being the best. If they were the best on the field and both scouts who are watching each of the alliances agreed, then they would get a four to show they were that special. We did the same for defense, but you can also do it so that there is the type of defense that they play are they doing it in a specific area? Are they just focusing on one robot or doing a combination of them? Are they pushing a robot and pinning them and backing off on time? Or are they actually just staying in a perpendicular form so that they are blocking a robot from getting from one place to the other? You can try and count how much time is delayed in a cycle, or you can figure out, have they actually gotten fouled for what they're doing? Because all those are very important things. In terms of counter defense, you would definitely want to consider the amount of pushes and pins or how well they are at being a perpendicular roadblock. Are they getting in the way of your teammates or are they uh, focusing on one defense robot? All of these will keep accumulate into how good of a driver or defense robot or counter D robot they are. 
This is something that is a little bit more complicated and you will definitely need some sort of algorithms in the background to be able to actually put this into a useful number such as driver ability or defensibility or so forth. So other data points that are generally very reliable or uh, very useful for a team are reliability in that if a team has an incapacitated robot that cannot move for the rest of the match or a robot that never moved, which is what we call disabled, how often does that happen? Generally, if a robot has more than 25% uh, of a in-cap or disabled rate, I would not recommend picking them because that means they might have issues going into ELIMS. Now, if it was only for the first two, three matches that they had those uh, reliability issues and they fixed it for the last ones, that is another thing to consider. So that actually brings me to my next point that I did not put in here of uh, trends. It may not be stated as an actual data point, but you want to look at the trends in the data as it goes about. So this is uh, generally seen in the visualization where you can have it graphed out so that you see from match one to match eight that they do, how do they perform? Is there an upward trend? Are they going down? Do they have some sort of broken mechanism that might cause this for just a few of their middle matches or so forth? You want to be able to have a notes section within the app so that uh, your scouts who are trained in this can write down any specific thing. Oh, they did a really good job playing defense at this time and this time so that you could look back at TBA later on to see how they actually play defense. You might want to take a look at fouls or you could just consider that something to put into the notes and other data points you guys can think of on your own after critically thinking about what you want to capture data on in a match. But generally, what I've outlined should be all that most teams need, if not more, uh, to create a successful scouting system in terms of the data collected. So finally, you can get a little bit creative with how you're actually collecting the data if you choose to do a custom scouting system. You could choose to have success rates, uh, or uh, which is something that you can do in the Excel spreadsheets. If you include timers, you can include cycle times, or you could even choose to have intake, you could type in location as a pop-up when you say that they have intaken a object. At the end of a game, you can choose to say when they head back for the end game and how much time it takes. And of course, one of the most important parts of this is actually success rate. If they do attempt it, you have to count that as one of their attempts. But if they don't, don't include it in that data. You want to see, do they have at least an 80 to 90% success rate with climbing? Or are they somehow fumbling along the way that you might want to help them with? Or maybe leave to another alliance partner. In terms of actual algorithms that you can choose to use, you can create a pickability algorithm that will rank all the teams in your uh, scouting system and output a rank of how likely they are or how good they are for a first or a second pick. This will make it so that if you go into a pick list meeting, you already have a relatively organized order of teams. It's not going from numeric order. It's not going off of ranked order because in my opinion, TBA rankings are not the greatest because it shows the alliance's skills, not the individual skills and so forth. It is definitely something that takes a lot more time, but in the long run is worth it if you choose to develop a custom scouting system and have a server to compute all of your data. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you will need some sort of defensive and driving rankings for a subjective system. And the way that we have found works best for that is some variation of an ELO system. That was what we used when I was on the team, but it is what they use in chess where everyone starts off with a set amount of points. If you win uh, or have a higher ranking, then you gain more points. But if you lose, you lose points. If you win against someone who's higher than you, you get a lot of points. But if you have... Uh, if you lose against someone who has less points, you lose a lot of points as well. So this kind of will naturally sort it out so long as you figure out how the algorithms work to rank out who has the best defense and who has the best driving. Uh, but you're also going to want to have some sort of other algorithms in place to quantify that. In 2018 in particular, we had a metric of cubes scored in the scale by time t. Uh, it was I believe around 120 seconds into the match, including auto, 
uh, maybe even earlier. But at that point, we realized scoring cubes into the scale did not matter. And even into the switches, because they were so uh, heavily influenced by the cubes that were already in there that it wasn't as advantageous to score in them. And oftentimes, they started going into the power up station instead. Now, that wasn't always the case, but that was a good way for us to sort out why did some teams stop scoring so much? And we instead looked at how many they were scoring by a certain point in a match to see who were the strongest scorers. Finally, placement quality. So if you look at this image, the blue side has a very or a relatively organized stack of cubes. You generally want to, in that game to have six cubes on the bottom laid out very neatly so that you could stack on top of it another six or maybe five or four. And if possible, at the very end in high level matches, you would put cubes on the third row or third, yeah, third row of it. On the other hand, the red side has a relatively disorganized scale. The way they're placing them in there, you can see that it does not have a smooth surface and they're having trouble placing the third, the next row up. You can actually see that the cube they are currently placing is in a completely different orientation, which will change the uh, leveling of it and make it very difficult for them to place more cubes in the future. While the blue scale may be higher right now, which means they're not scoring points, if blue did it right in this match, which I did not watch this one in particular, they have a much easier time of taking back the scale, depending on if they choose to, if they value it in the match. All right, so finally, we get to visualization. How do you want to see the data? Well, generally, people like to use uh, uh, viewer apps. So you want to have it something that is accessible, which means you either have it on a phone app or an Excel sheet. The third alternative, if you have a um, paper scouting system, is to just have a Slack or a Discord channel dedicated to transmitting that data to your captains or your strategists. Uh, you want to make it so that anyone can access it or anyone who is allowed access to the data can access it at any time. Uh, you want to make sure they have the data that they need to be able to plan out a match. So this, in my opinion, relies on uh, a few core features throughout the whole thing. You want to have a match schedule because you don't want to keep switching apps to be able to find everything. And within that, you want to be able to see the data of a match. You want to see uh, the overall score of it. You want to see the ranking points, who won. And you want to be able to see the actual scoring calculations that you have within the match. Oops. Uh, so if you look at this image right here, I know it's a little bit small, but you can actually see that uh, they have the different scoring metrics underneath it. This allows us to see who is doing what in the match. And if you actually click on the team's number right here, it would bring you to their actual uh, data from that match or their uh, average data here. Graphing is, in my opinion, a little bit extra. If you can have it, that's great, but that is definitely a nice to have, not an essential. If you can, you should incorporate the photos because as I mentioned, there's so many teams that it gets a little bit difficult to sometimes remember all of them, but that is definitely a nice to have as well because you can also just have them in some sort of off uh, non-scouting app system or you don't even need it if you just remember uh, what they can do. Finally, you can choose to have a pick list feature in the app, but uh, I would say that actually having a paper system for the pick list on the day of is a little bit more reliable. When you go into an actual pick list meeting, uh, you want to have a pick list editor that everyone can see. So, and before I, continue, I should have prefaced it with this. All of the photos I have of the scouting systems are what you can find either online through people's websites or through the white paper of 1678. So you can read more there. I will have it linked over in the last slide. Uh, so don't worry, this is not confidential in any way. Uh, didn't steal it from my old team or anything, but yeah. So this was the pick list editor that we had back then, uh, where as you can see, we have the teams here and the, what number they are in the pick list. The pickability is what I was talking about earlier, where it ranks the out how good they are to be picked. We have the other metrics, such as the driver ability, how often they climbed, 
uh, how much they scored and in the telly and auto. And then we have uh, how often they went incapacitated, uh, which as you can see, we also have it color coded so that as you had more time going in cap, your number would get redder and redder showing that it was not the greatest. This is also, I believe, a fake set of data. So don't take it for granted, especially since all these other teams are in the 9,000s, which don't exist yet, but just something to consider. Uh, the most core features of this, I would say, are having the team data with averages. You wanna be able to sort them and filter them so that you can have it ranked out. And you wanna be able to see the team data by each match. The next best feature to add in would be a graph feature where you can choose two different one to two different teams and select a data point and graph it out by match so that you can see how they are doing in an overall trend. Are they going up? Are they going down? Did they have some weird dip in the middle because they went in cap or so forth? Uh, photos, if you can link it in, is great. If not, don't worry. One thing that I actually liked that my team did in the past was we would have all of our photos just on smug mug and doing that uh we just pulled it up through the smug mug uh albums and we would just look at it that way but later on we did also find a way to incorporate it so that if you typed in the team number right here it would automatically pop up the team photo right over here so that we could see it without having to go anywhere which was honestly better but it was a lot more time intensive to program that in and definitely not a necessity and as i said you aren't going to want to use this pick list editor on the actual day of competition because of re Wi-Fi reliability issues. So instead, at the end of the night, we have someone write it down on a piece of paper and we give that to our uh, strategist slash team representative. As the day goes on in the second day of quals, we are constantly updating it. And then we will give, again, an updated pick list to our alliance representative to go onto stage with. While having an electronic scouting system is great, it's not entirely ready, especially uh, given the amount of resources and time we have to make one that can be used for everything. So it is still good to have a paper and pencil backup. All right, finally, next steps. What can you do after this? So first of all, uh, here are some online resources that you can look at. There's the 1678 white papers, there is a, I believe, a fall workshop for how to make a scouting system. Uh, you can look at a paper scouting system from 2056, I believe from 2017. And 2102 did a great job of publicizing and uh, advertising their scouting system. I believe theirs was completely open source when I did it. So these are all different places that you can look for different types of scouting systems and so forth. Uh, you're going to want to decide what type of scouting system you want after this. Do you want to stick with paper and pencil? Do you want to have some sort of Google form and Tableau system? Or do you want to go completely from scratch to have an electronic scouting system? You're going to figure out how much time uh, and people you want to devote to it and how much money you devote to it as well. So over on this right side, we have a photo of those two Pelican cases I was talking about. We actually had a third one for just the computer stuff and other things in general. But these are purely our tablets and the charting system built into the cases, which was a project for our uh, electrical sub team to do during the off season, which we will get into in my kickoff presentation. Uh, but this is the type of capital that we uh, put into for our scouting system. Uh, if you guys have the resources, you can do that. I'm not saying that you should, but it's just something to consider. All right, do you have any questions for me? Go ahead, Nico. Yeah, um, getting into, I saw what you said about like using Google Tableau and the custom apps and all that. What about, uh, what is your opinion on Microsoft Power Apps? I have not looked into that, so I would not be able to say. I would have to say if it is, is it a sort of like data visualization thing like Tableau? Not exactly. So what uh, what Power Apps does is it lets you, because um, I use this at um, it lets, and 
this Granada has the license to it. It lets you create a custom app and from templates. So you can kind of just drag and drop different parts from different apps and go from there. If you have access to it so that it's uh, free and that you have um, the knowledge to do it, I would say go for it. But if you don't feel confident in there being enough online resources or uh, mentor support for that, I would say go with something simpler like Android Studios. Yeah, okay. Are there any other questions? If you feel uh, a little bit weird about saying it out loud, feel free to just DM me in the chat and I can read it out loud from there. Uh, you can either send it to everyone or just me, or you can send it to Angela and she can read it out loud, whatever you prefer, and I can answer it that way. Otherwise, we can take a little bit of a break. And if you're interested, you can stick around for my next workshop, which will be about leading a successful kickoff. All right, I will be closing off questions at 11.50, where we will then take a five minute break, um, and then we'll move on to the next uh, workshop if there are no other questions. All right, so I have a question, which is how would you uh, negate the impacts of scouting being perceived as boring? So the way that we used to do it was we would always uh, have, well, there were two different things. First of all, we had a lot of scouts. So we had at least 21 scouts in at a time on Citrus. So that makes it so that there's more people scouting at once. And it was just an expectation of everyone scouting. The other thing was that to be able to get onto travel team was a privilege. So if you didn't get onto travel team, you weren't even able to be a scout. So they knew that they wanted to be a scout to be on travel team. Uh, but there were two major things I would say that made it less boring to them. First, we had, because we had 21 scouts in at a time, at, or about that many, those who were doing the objective scouting, the auto teleop and end game scouting we had it so that they had a we had an algorithm that figured out whose data was accurate by comparing it against the other people scouting the same robot and we had it so that the most uh reliable scout got a prize at the end 
But the other thing was that we would highlight how we use the scouting data at the end of the competition so that we would say it wasn't just a meaningless task. This is how we used it. We used it to plan these match strategies. We used it to figure out this uh, robot for our second pick, which was ranked here in our pick list. And thanks to your data, we were able to get that. The other thing is you can just give people more breaks to do. Uh, so if you have plenty of people on the team, but not everyone is scouting at once, frequently rotate them out so that they are constantly getting a chance to do other things. Uh, I found that when I got too many breaks, actually, I got bored. Whereas scouting, the match gave me a task to do to keep focused. So I enjoyed scouting. Do we have any other questions? All right. In that case, why don't we uh, get together at uh, 12 o'clock to uh, have the next presentation. We'll take about an eight minute break. And Angela, can you let others know that I will be starting the kickoff presentation at 12? Yeah, I'll ping them. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm.